Is it time? Okay, I think we're just gonna start now. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Miriam Taher Zachary as the president of Rita Foundation and on behalf of my team uh, with me tonight, I would like to thank you for joining uh, our live uh, Rita Foundation's Women's Health event for 2020. Uh, guys, is the live going? Yes, you can see? Okay, perfect. So we encourage you to send your questions in the comment section or via private message uh, at Rita Foundation's page. We would like to thank everyone who sent their questions after we started promoting the event uh, four weeks ago. And uh, to maintain your privacy, we want to reassure everyone that, you that we will ask your questions anonymously on your behalf and Dr. Alamani will answer them after his presentation. Just a quick recap, uh, Rita Foundation is a non-for-profit foundation for that, I want to thank my team members for volunteering their time to help plan and promote past and future events. Uh, our short-term goal is to raise awareness and thrive in the fight against uh, preventive diseases. And accordingly, we have conducted events in the past, bringing attention to different tumor sites, including and not limited to uh, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, in, two, in 2020, though, we focused on uh, COVID-19 initiatives. Uh, with that said, we hope uh, that you and your um, uh, family are doing well and that we all are able to soon put this pandemic behind us, hopefully. Um, before introducing my teams, I wanted to um, emphasize on the fact that tonight we have a special and uh, an important guest, Dr. Carlos Alamani, joining us to share not only, uh, first of all, just to emphasize on his specialty, not only he is an oncologist, but he's also subspecialized in breast cancer and he's also the medical director for the clinical research department at Advent Health which makes him uh, very special to us uh, because he will be able to answer, uh, to share with you the most updated information uh, pertaining to this topic um, from research to screening all the way to uh, treatment. And while we are waiting uh, for uh, Dr. Alamani to join us, we will take a few minutes for my team members to introduce themselves. So I'm gonna start with the first team member, uh, Dr. Ahmed Zakari, who is a, a vice president, uh, I mean, Rita Foundation's vice president, and uh, who happened to be my husband. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Zakari. Uh, I uh, chair the division of uh, hematology and oncology at Advent Health. Uh, uh, Dr. Alamani, he is a good friend of mine. He's one of my colleagues. It's going to be a superb uh, event, uh, uh, very knowledgeable. Uh, as we know, there, are, there were so many challenges this year in terms of uh, COVID and pandemic uh, time, uh, very few programs that have been canceled. However, I think our foundation wants to continue its mission in terms of helping those who are in need, those helping educating, educating our community and more so those who are in need in terms of mammogram and to be set up to see physician in uh, breast cancer or any other cancers. Uh, uh, guys, we love for you to kind of stay connected and uh, really kind of a little bit uh, follow up with Dr. Alamani. He's one of the best guys you will learn from uh, uh, program. If you have any questions, either you can uh, message them as Miriam said, or kind of text them to us personally and we'll send him the, the message. Uh, our next person is Naima Smiri. Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Nema Smeri and I am uh, honored to be here tonight. I've been uh, volunteering and um, helping the community for sim serving the community for so many years. In 2018, I had the honor to become a board member with the nonprofit organization, Rita Foundation, mainly in, in charge of the youth program and networking. Thank you very much. And good evening, everyone. My name is Abdul Bukhil. I'm a real estate broker uh, by profession. Uh, and I'm one of the founding members of Rita Foundation. 
Uh, this organization is dear to me because it really helps us a lot and helps a lot of uh, community members, uh, mainly one of the most important aspects of our lives, which is healthcare. Um, so I appreciate both doctors, I appreciate Miriam and all the board members who put a great effort putting this um, live together. Thank you and uh, hope everyone would benefits and ask as many questions as possible. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Iman Boudlel. Um, I joined Rita Foundation in 2018. I hold a uh, bachelor's in biology and I'm currently attending medical school. And I'm so proud to be a part of this nonprofit organization, helping others. It's always been my passion to just reach out and uh, help the people around me. And thank you for joining us tonight. I'm gonna present to you our next member, Hafid Bujidi. Hello everyone, uh, this is Hafid Bujidi. I've been a member since uh, last year, proudly, and I have an honor of uh, working with those awesome uh, people. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alamani. Thank you, Dr. Zach. Thank you, Ida, for uh, all the work that you do, you do for the community. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, team. We encourage you guys to uh, send your questions in the comment section or in a messenger uh, if you want to uh, remain anonymous. But we, Dr. Alamani will answer your questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, just um, to add, uh, Dr. Alamani, he's fluent in English and Spanish. Uh, he completed his residency and, uh, residency and fellowship training at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He is... Uh, uh, superior patient care and sophisticated research have earned him multiple recognitions from Orlando Magazine as one of the top doctors in Orlando and from Best Doctors Inc. as one of the best doctors in America. Dr. Alamani, thank you so much for joining us tonight and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Miriam. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, you're Wonderful. good. So thank you so much. And it's an honor to, to participate in this wonderful event for the Rita Foundation. And, and I congratulate you guys because you guys have an incredible mission. So again, I, I wish I could hug you right now. So a virtual hug for you guys and keep up the good work. Thank you. This evening, I'm gonna be sharing a simple presentation of the diagnosis and initial treatment for breast cancer. This is meant to be informal and I'm hoping that you guys can get some good information from this. And at the end, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So I'll go with the, I have prepared some slides for you here. Uh, these are some of the objectives. So hopefully we can achieve some of these tonight. Uh, briefly, I'm gonna review some of the statistics for breast cancer. I'm gonna describe the typical presentation of breast cancer uh, that we see, the current approach in the community. And then I'm gonna describe the multidisciplinary approach that we have at Appen Health Cancer Institute that may help significantly the, the delivery of medical care for our breast cancer patients. A little bit of, of a statistics, uh, breast cancer is the number one cancer in females. On the right side, you're gonna see all the cancer, the top 10 cancer uh, reasons for uh, ladies. And on the left side, it's gonna be males. Breast cancer is 30% of all cancer uh, cases or, or diagnosis in females. So it's a significant number. Some of the statistics from 2016, around 246,000 new cases of breast cancer, which is roughly 14.6% of all cancers of male or females. Uh, lung cancer is the number one uh, cancer or number one in both females and, and, and males. Prostate cancer, obviously only in males and colon cancer in both females and males. The estimated number of deaths from breast cancer is around 40,000. So luckily, even though it's a very prevalent cancer, luckily we do very well with breast cancer. So a minority of the patients, unfortunately, or, or fortunately a minority will pass away from this disease. Uh, it's 6.8% of all cancer deaths. Number one would be lung cancer, and number two, colon cancer with Dr. Ahmed Zachary, who's an expert in colon cancer. So that's what he treats for a living. Uh, these are some of the trends of different types of cancers. And you can see on the bottom that most of them are fairly flat and lung and bronchus cancers. Actually, they're going down a little bit because we're uh, doing a good job in the community of telling people that smoking does increase the risk of cancer and people are and less and less nowadays smoking, at least cigarettes. Colon cancer uh, and rectal cancer also is in the decline. But if you look at breast cancer, actually you can trace actually there is an increase in the breast cancer cases over the years instead of going down. 
the risk, uh, the potential risk of developing breast cancer in the lifetime of a lady in the United States is approximately one in eight. So it's a very high risk of developing compared to other countries where it could be one in 20, one in 30, or even higher than that. Uh, you can see a list here of all the cancers, how, how prevalent they are in the, in the life of a female with ovarian cancer being one in 80 and leukemia one in 77 compared to breast cancer one in eight. Uh, these are the trends. So these are some of the good news that we have for breast cancer in general is that through the years we have gotten better in diagnosing and treating breast cancer and less and less ladies are, are thankfully dying from this disease. So if you compare it to 1975 to 1977, is 75% of patients made it to five years. If you look at the next, de next decade in 1987 to 89, it was around 60, I'm sorry, 84%. And then when you went up to 2015, it's up to 91% of ladies who will make it to five years. And this, num this uh, number uh, or this uh, data is actually before the newer classes of drugs were, got approved, and approved by, the, by the FDA. So this number probably is even higher than 91% nowadays. Uh, in 2016, the prevalence of, of cancer or breast cancer patients alive in the U.S. was 3 million ladies alive with breast cancer. Uh, and again, the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer will be around 12.4% in the lifetime of a lady. So again, it's almost one in 10 will have breast cancer eventually diagnosed. The, when we look at how, how old are the patients that actually get diagnosed with breast cancer, you're gonna see that towards the middle to the right side of that graph, the majority of ladies are over the age of 45 and a minority is less than 45. Um, when you look at less than 35, we're talking about a very small number. Obviously I'm a breast cancer specialist, so I do have patients in their twenties and thirties, but luckily it is the minority. But once you hit the age of 40, that number starts climbing. And once you hit 45, that number starts really increasing. So does the, the, the need to get mammograms at an early age of 40, starting at 40 or on a regular basis is very important. So we don't miss those patients that unfortunately are getting diagnosed in their early 40, 40th decade of life. And again, here is some of the recommendations at the between 40 and 44 years of age. We recommend that start doing the mammogram. Certain, some of the different associations recommend that you can do it every other day for the first four years between 40 and 44. Depending on the risk factor of the patient or the density of their breast, that may not be recommended. We may recommend to continue on a yearly basis. But in general, I can tell you that by age 40, we start recommending uh, all patients to start getting a yearly mammogram. That way you don't miss out. If some people actually can skip two or three years before they know it, they have a tumor that have grown during those years that you're taking a break from mammograms. So that, that we try not to, we try to avoid that issue. Uh, obviously, mammograms after the age of 85 are extremely important. So, because those are the peaks, peak uh, ages for breast cancer development. Some of the risk factors for breast, breast cancer are the following: personal history of breast cancer is the number one risk factor. So, again, if you have breast cancer for uh, one time, you are at higher risk than anybody else to develop it again. Number two, family history of breast cancer. Number three, genetic predisposition with a known deleterious mutation. So a lot of people will talk about Angelina Jolie who had a prophylactic mastectomy. She did not have breast cancer as far as we know, but her mother had breast cancer. Her aunt had ovarian cancer. She was diagnosed with a specific BRCA or BRCA mutation. And she had the same mutation. She knew that she, it was about, a time, about time before she would develop that malignancy. So she made the incredible and very brave decision to do bilateral mastectomies, immediate reconstruction. And then at age 40, she took out her ovaries. So virtually rendering her chances of developing breast or ovarian cancer near zero. Elevated estrogen levels. So ladies that are taking um, birth control pills for more than 10 years, that is a risk factor. Or people that are taking hormone replacement therapy after they become a monopausal, that also increases your risk factor for breast cancer. I mentioned earlier dense breast tissue. So ladies that have a, den a denser breast tissue, it makes it harder for mammogram to diagnose uh, smaller tumors. And thus, uh, do we need to utilize ultrasounds and MRIs to try to make things easier for us to diagnose breast cancer. Patients that actually have higher bone mineral density tend to have a higher risk for breast cancer. And the reason is because of the higher levels of estrogen in their, in their system. So again, estrogen is good for our bones. So the more estrogen you have in your system, the, the more solid those bones are, but also the risk is higher for developing breast cancer. Patients that actually have their first menstrual cycle before the age of 12, that, that is considered early, 
or late after the age of 50. So those are risk factors. Why? Because you're, you're having basically estrogen producing your body at a higher level for many more years compared to the usual 12, to, uh, 12 as the age of the first menstrual cycle. Uh, and usually by age 45 to 50 is when we have menopause. Patients that actually do not have any children, the same thing is true. So if you did not have a, if you did not have a pregnancy, then the estrogen levels continue to be the same high levels through your whole life until you become menopausal. And then those ladies that actually have their first baby after the age of 30, also that puts you at increased risk for breast cancer. Again, because you had those first 18 years or even more years of life with unopposed estrogen production, which increases your risk for breast cancer. Um, as we get older, as I showed in one of the initial graphs, as you get older, the risk of breast cancer goes up. Again, patients that are obese uh, also are increased risk for breast cancer, but that is true for postmenopausal ladies. So ladies that are overweight, but they're premenopausal, that doesn't seem to increase your risk for breast cancer, but it does increase your, your, can your, your risk for other types of cancers, including colon cancer, kidney cancer, et cetera. So obviously obesity is not a good thing and no matter what age, but in breast cancer risk is usually for the postmenopausal lady that I worry the most. And the reason is because when you, you become postmenopausal, and that's the, the main reason why people don't understand why this is so. So when you're becoming menopausal, the estrogen production doesn't come from your ovaries. It comes from the fatty tissue. So the, the more fatty tissue, there's an enzyme called aromatase and aromatase transforms androgens into estrogens and thus increase the level of estrogens which puts you at risk for breast cancer. Ladies that, in, that have this increased uh, level of alcohol consumption at a risk and smoking as well. Smoking is, is a little bit less uh, uh, directly involved, but there is there is some correlation, but alcohol is a good correlation. So when you compare the risk factors of this country compared to other countries that do not drink that much alcohol or Europe for that matter, then you're gonna see that those countries that don't drink that much alcohol, actually they have a, a lower incidence of breast cancer. Um, we could spend the whole night talking about alcohol, and I'm sure there's going to be some questions about this uh, when we finish the presentation, but I'll tell you a couple of things. Number one is that Europeans, they have done some studies showing that if ladies drink less than one drink per day, or actually males too, less than one drink per, per day, meaning between four and five per week maximum, the risk does not appear to be much higher. In the American studies, actually, if you're drinking for ladies one or less drinks per, per day, um, you also do not increase your risk for cancer. For men, it would be two drinks per day. Um, the American Cancer Society recently put an opinion saying that there is no safe level of alcohol that they can condone. So even though the Europeans set a number and the Americans set an another number, the truth may be somewhere in the middle or perhaps not even on either one of those two. So the fact is that if you don't need to drink alcohol, don't drink alcohol. And if you do drink alcohol, drinking in moderation, please people that actually work during the night have a higher chance of developing breast cancer. And that is an association that has been done well documented over the last few years. So again, if you're a night uh, work, night shift worker, you have that risk factor. And then the last one would be exposure to ionizing radiation. We know that patients that have had radiation to their chest for the or to the thyroid, they have a, a higher risk of developing breast cancer. A patient that have had a history of Hodgkin's lymphoma that has been cured, but they use radiation to the chest or to the axilla that can also increase your risk for breast cancer. So let's talk about the typical presentation of breast cancer. Um, usually it's a breast mass, but that's usually in the, patient, in the patients that actually can feel it. In the majority of patients, you don't feel it. So it's actually the mammogram that saves your life. Axillary masses can also be a sign of, of cancer of the breast. So again, that means like fullness of the axilla under the arm, the armpit. A redness of the, of the skin of the breast, it happens, it's not common, but when it happens, it could be dramatic. A, in ladies that actually are lactating, that happens often. So if they have doubts, they need to see their doctor right away because it could be, it could be something simple like what we call mastitis of, of lactation. But in ladies that are not lactating, that is not a normal situation. So they need to see the physicians right away to have the proper evaluations. If the nipple changes form or inverts, that is not normal. So, so again, any changes in the skin or the nipple should be evaluated by your physician right away. Do not sit on these things long. The same thing can happen on the side of the breast. If you see that there's some dimpling of the skin of the breast, that is not normal. You need to see your, your gynecologist or your primary care physician and they, they will do the proper investigation. 
also let's say your breasts have always been the same size all your life and all of a sudden now your right or left breast now looks larger or heavier that is not normal so when in doubt you go see your doctor they will do the proper evaluations and if they're still in doubt then you should be referred to a breast surgeon to have a proper evaluation so what is a typical approach of breast cancer in the community so this is what happens on a daily basis out there in the community and even some things in our system as well, but usually this is what we see, the story, the, what we call the horror stories in the community. So the, we know that mammograms save lives. That is usually the first uh, line of, of evaluation that we have. It's an x-ray picture of, of your breast. Nowadays we do 3D mammograms or, or, or tomograms, which are much better. They can see through the breast much easier. So just to compare, a typical mammogram of the old days, uh, the diagnostic mammogram, which is the one that they have to do many, many different views of your breast, is as good as the screening mammogram nowadays. So thank goodness the, the mammograms um, that we have um, uh, nowadays are much better to locate, identify small tumors. And I'm going to show you a picture in just a minute. They're not 100% accurate. That means that if you still have doubts because you feel something in the breast, you should not stop with the mammogram. And if your doctor's not sure, then they need to refer you to a breast surgeon to do the proper testing. Ultrasounds and MRIs are also available for our evaluation. So this is a picture of an ultrasound machine with the lady being evaluated and the ultrasound pictures at the bottom. Those little circles are cystic lesions in the breast. They tend to be benign. Again, they're not 100% accurate, but when you combine it with examination and with a mammogram, now you can have a better view of the breast. And when in doubt, then we go for the, for the breast MRI. This is a mammogram. Uh, this is actually one of the newer types of mammograms. And if you look on the back of this, of this picture, you're gonna see towards the back, there's a little circle, like a little sphere. That is a small breast tumor found in this breast. Now, this is an easy breast to look at because you can see, pretty much you can see a lot of details in this breast. But we have ladies that unfortunately, they have such dense breast tissue that looks all white. So it's impossible to see anything there. So this is a patient that has moderate density of the breast. The left breast was in 2014. The, the, again, the, the same pictures looked at a year later in 2015. There was a difference between the two and it was caught by the radiologist thanks to the newer techniques. And you can see on the top of the big image, there's like a little sphere or, or, or lesion that is actually new that you could not see before. And the density of the breast makes it hard, kind of hard, but it was enough for the radiologist to say, you know what, we need to get more views. We need to get a, an ultrasound. And eventually this lady had, had a biopsy. So how does a biopsy work? So the biopsy is simple. They take a needle a, guided by an ultrasound and they go for the area where the tumor is. So when, for example, the mammogram that I showed you before, that is good, but with the ultrasound, they can actually can look at it even easier. So they put the needle right where that lesion is and they suction some of the cells of, of, that, of that tumor or that lesion. And then they send that to the pathologist. The pathologist will tell us number one, if it is cancer and if it is not cancer, what type of lesion it is. Is it benign or is it a lesion that potentially could become malignant in the future? There are special markers that are done with this type of, um, of testing. Uh, they include estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, and something called HER2 new amplification, which is a protein that is overexpressed in the membranes, brain brain of these cancer cells, which makes it more aggressive. So again, if we have a diagnosis of breast cancer, they will check for estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 new amplification and immediately that will alert the oncology and surgical teams how to approach that patient much faster and in a way different compared that if we didn't have that information. So I'm gonna give you an example here. This is a 62 year old lady um, uh, that, is, that is going to the, to the mammographic uh, center, to radiology center for evaluation of a breast lump. So the first steps, the patient is referred to the radiation, radiology center for a diagnostic mammogram because she went primary, first to the primary doctor. There's no order in the, in the system for an ultrasound because many times the primary doctors don't know that they need to order the diagnostic mammogram and the ultrasound. So that could be a delay perhaps of a few minutes or perhaps a couple of hours until they get a hold of the doctor, but hopefully that ultrasound is done the same day. The patient has both studies and is told to call her doctor for a report because the doctor is the one controlling that patient's care. Her doctor sets up a, a, an image guided biopsy after he or she hears that the patient has been diagnosed with cancer. This process can take between a week and two weeks and up to a month, depending on the situation. Once the biopsy is done and the pathologist confirmed that typically the radiology center calls the patient or the doctor and tells them, listen, there's cancer uh, uh, diagnosed, we need to get a surgical evaluation. 
So that, that ball is put in the court back of the, of the primary doctor or gynecologist. And if the patient already knows a, a surgeon, that helps because that patient knows that, you know what, I know a surgeon, they can help me out with this. So again, the, if the patient knows a surgeon, it facilitates the evaluation. Otherwise, the patient needs to wait again for the primary doctor to call a surgeon or call a center to get an appointment. And again, that could take a week, but it could take actually much longer than that. So the patient finally sees the surgeon. The surgeon has an appointment. Uh, after a month of waiting, the patient sees the surgeon. Finally, the surgeon sees the patient and says, you know what, you need surgery right away. But from the time of the diagnosis of the lump that the patient felt to the time of the surgeon, who, who knows how long it is, how much time they could have lasted. It could have been uh, two or three weeks, but it could have been two or three months. And when, every time that I see a patient for an opinion after they have gone through all this, and I, I'm now getting into the game at the end of, the, of all this process, I feel for the patient because it's very hard for them. So, so again, most of the time, the referrals to the medical oncologist and to the radiation oncologist don't occur until much later. So obviously this is not a very a, a efficient way of dealing with breast cancer or any cancer for that matter. The patient feels frustrated. That's a picture of one of, the, if anybody likes Star Wars, that's one of the characters of Star Wars. I don't, she, she, I don't think she's very happy. So that's why I put that one there. Uh, patients may not understand the diagnosis because sometimes unfortunately that the primary doctor or the, even their surgeon might not have the right tools to explain to them what they're facing. Uh, patients may have low confidence in their care by this time. So obviously you can imagine the morale could be down to the floor and the treatment delays are very common. So obviously this is not the way that we can do. We can do much better than this. So our center, like many other centers around the nation, we have figured out that we don't want this to happen to our patients because we don't want this to happen to a family member. So the multidisciplinary clinic or approach has evolved through the years. And when I trained up in Cleveland, they did that every single week, two or three times a week, they had multidisciplinary clinic, which means that the patients are able to see an normal mammogram, see the specialist within the same week, get a plan for care, and then move on with, with life. So this is usually what happens. Primary care physicians, uh, it notices that there's an abnormal mammogram and possible new breast tumor. He or she calls immediately the breast cancer care program, in this case, Abbott Health. They activate the system. We have a nurse navigator that immediately gets in contact with that patient. Uh, that, that patient is taken now by the hand by the nurse navigator and, and basically set up to meet all the specialists. If, the, if everything is coordinated correctly, that patient typically um, obviously that now the biopsy has been done already, but in case that the patient has not had a biopsy yet, but they have a papal mess and the primary doctor is, is, is worried that cancer is in the diagnosis, the nurse navigator will make sure that the biopsy is set up and starts working and getting the team ready behind her in case that she does have cancer. So many times I hear about a case that is being prepped for us before the diagnosis and we're just waiting to see if it's cancer, we see the patient. If it's not cancer, then obviously the corresponding specialist will see the patient. But once the diagnosis is made of breast cancer, the nurse navigator will make sure that that patient sees all the specialists as quickly as possible, and ideally the same day. So in our center, in Dr. Zachary's center, we have a, a clinic set up so that when the patient comes in, is welcomed by our medical assistants. Uh, our geneticist is now involved in the care of these patients as well. So when we need them, we pull them into the system. Uh, we have the medical oncologist, the surgeon, and the radiation oncologist all at the same time seeing that patient. So when that patient leaves that day, the patient has seen three consoles and maybe a fourth, depending if they need to talk to the geneticist. And that way, that patient is now empowered with information. So again, the surgeon explains the surgical options, uh, breast conservation therapy versus a uh, mastectomy. The medical oncologist will explain systemic options such as chemotherapy and hormone therapy. And the radiation doctor will explain possible radiation options depending on the type of surgery or the findings of the time of surgery or a presentation. So, so now the patient has a better idea of what they're they are facing, and now they're gonna be empowered to really fight this cancer in a much better way. The nurse navigator will continue holding the hand of that, of that patient through the system, and even through the time of chemotherapy or other therapies as well. Um, once we have met that patient, that patient's case is actually shared at the tumor board. The tumor board is a collection of all our specialists that actually treat, for example, in this case, breast cancer, and we meet every single week to discuss all the cases of that week. So that patient that I presented, a 62-year-old with the new breast mass that is palpable, all that information will be presented. We'll look at the imaging. We'll look at the pathology. We'll, look, we'll talk to the surgeons, the radiation oncologists, medical oncologists. The geneticists will be there. And they will make a concerted plan to actually take care of that patient in a much better way. 
So this is basically a concierge service. I mean, the patient will have world-class care when they go through this system. It's not gonna be as stressful as it used to be in the past, at least through our system. The patient will be scheduled and will be hopefully looking like this other Star Wars character, smiling and ready to, to fight this cancer. So ultimately, this is what we want. We want our patients to be um, um, empowered with the right information to make the decisions. If they wish to have a second opinion because they still want to get that, absolutely. We, we always recommend that if you want a second opinion that you, that you follow that. But because we have our team set up in a way, you're not getting one opinion. You're getting a multitude of opinions, not only for the three specialists that actually see you that day, but also during the tumor board, the rest of the team, which is composed of uh, breast surgeons, like I mentioned, and a bunch of other specialists. Um, I hope that this information has helped you get a better understanding how we how the process goes for breast cancer or newly diagnosed breast cancer patients. Uh, Appen Health uh, during the month of October is doing $30 screening mammograms. So if you uh, do not have medical insurance, or for whatever reason, you cannot get your mammogram through your insurance and you want to have it, Appen Health will do it for you. So if you call Appen Health Orlando um, and ask them to connect you to radiology, they will guide you how to this how to get the, the mammogram um, scheduled. You can also go online and you can find out how to do it. Um, I'm going to stop there. I hope I didn't make anybody crazy with all the details that I mentioned, but I hope I really educated you guys and I'm open for questions. No, Dr. Alamani, actually it is perfect. Uh, do you guys see me there? I'm gonna stop sharing. <laughs> Give me one second. All right, now you can see you. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Uh, it answered a lot of the questions that we have received, but we still have uh, other questions. And thank you for bringing up the fact that Advent Health has different resources. What we will be doing after uh, tonight's event, we will be sharing those flyers on Rita Foundation's page about mammogram. Uh, I also wanted to let you know that we will be sharing your RAC card. Uh, so that way, um, people will know how to uh, contact uh, your office uh, if they uh, need to. I also wanted to emphasize on the fact that you uh, speak Spanish fluently. <laughs> so that can benefit a lot of... Dr. Sacker is teaching me Moroccan, by the way. <laughs> Good <laughs> luck. <laughs> uh, with that said, I would like to start with the first question. Uh, two ladies actually asked almost the, the same uh, question, so we translated it. Um, this is exactly how it was phrased. So I'm going to ask both questions because they're almost similar. I sometimes feel pain in my right breast, especially when I'm under stress. I wake up fe uh, feeling a burning sensation around, around my breast. Is this normal? And the second person uh, asked, I am under stress recently. Looks like everyone is under stress. Yeah. And I feel pressure and pain in my right breast. I have, I have to press on it for it to go away. This never happened to me. I even feel a sharp pain near my heart. What should I do? So in both situations, I would certainly, uh, and how old are they? Did they put their ages or not? Uh, no, they, they are following us on, on Facebook. So I really Very don't. Good. No problem. So, so I think that any, any time that we hear breast pain, most doctors will say, oh, that's not breast cancer. The truth is around 10 to 15% of, of cancer uh, of the breast presents with pain in the breast. So I don't think that they should ignore it. They should see their primary doctors or gynecologists. And if they haven't done, done, not done so yet, they should have a ma diagnostic mammogram with ultrasound of their breast. Okay, so you do suggest a uh, mammogram and- Absolutely, uh, with ultrasound. They, they need to understand if this is something benign or if it is actually something important. And talking about mammogram, we just received another question. Can a diagnostic mammo see something that a screening mammo doesn't? Absolutely, it can. So, so the, the, nowadays the mammograms, when they go through the breast, just imagine that you're going through a book with all the pages. That's how the, the new mammograms work. In the old days, it was just one page. Now they go through the whole thickness of the breast and it goes slice by slice. So they can see things, let's say in the first slice, they couldn't see it, but in the number 10, they could. Now they can see it better. Very good, very good. Now, uh, since we all had to deal with this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, we had few questions. Uh, one of them was, how can I protect myself from uh, COVID-19? So this is a breast cancer patient and um, they wanted to know like if it's, 
if it's just like a, a normal person or they have to go the extra, Very good. extra that's a great question so number one thing that you can do to protect yourself is wear a mask a hundred percent of the time when you're outside of your home and then it try to minimize contacts with people that you don't live with in the people that you live with make sure that they're not uh, participating in high risk uh, gatherings because that you know obviously you're going to defeat the purpose there Good hand washing is very important. Anytime you get out of your house, you need to have those alcohol solutions in your hands so you can clean your hands all the time. So sanitizers are very important. Uh, so good hand washing, social distancing, you wear your mask. In regards to the type of mask, make sure that it's a mask that if, if it's a surgical mask, that's great. But if not, it should have a two or three ply mask to make sure that it's thick enough. Th thick enough. If you take a candle and you can blow it with your mask on, that mask is not good enough for you. You cannot blow the candle in front of you. And the candle is going to be a good eight inches from you. Okay. So, so that would be so to a number. That's, those are basics. Yeah, those are basics. But for example, for the patient with breast cancer that has finished all the chemotherapy and, and is now on a maintenance medication that is oral, that patient has pretty much the same risk as most patients out there with COVID, with, for COVID-19 in their age group, in their age group. If they're going through chemotherapy, they are higher risk. So they have to be very careful that they have to take uh, extra precautions during this pandemic so that they don't get infected while they're getting chemotherapy. Um, and then if they have metastatic disease and depending on the type of therapy they're receiving, their white count may be low. And that is so, they also are increased risk for having complications from COVID-19 or any infection for that matter, including influenza. So they need to be all vaccinated for influenza no matter what age at this time. Okay, very good. Uh, now, uh... You mentioned before the fact that uh, when we are four years old, we you know we have to do a mammogram regularly, and um, when we are high risk. But we, we just received the question: At what age should we get an exam or a mammogram? So again, I think that old uh, ladies when they start seeing a gynecologist, they will have an initial exam, and then they will tell you, depending on on, on the anatomy of the patient, they will tell you how often that patient needs to have it, either yearly or every other year. So it depends on on every person. But if that lady, young lady, uh, let's say 25 or 28 years old, has a family history of breast cancer or a known deleterious mutation in the family, that patient needs to be examined at least twice a year, and she needs to know mm -hmm. how to examine herself. So th these are resources that you can find through the American Cancer Society of how to do self-examination of the breast. Try not to do, do ex self-examinations during the time uh, of your period because the breast uh, gets more tender and there's some changes in the breast that are gonna confuse the patient. So you need to be at least a week and a half, 10 days after your, your cycle to feel the right uh, way your breast feels. Very good. Going back to uh, COVID-19, uh, what, what COVID-19 symptoms should breast cancer patients be on the lookout for? So, uh, you know, unfortunately, when you when patients are getting chemotherapy with breast cancer, they will have a change of taste when they're getting chemotherapy. But change of smell usually is not that common with chemotherapy. So if they do get change of smell at any type or any stage of their cancer, that should be a red flag that potentially they could be infected. So they should be going back to the doctors or to, for example, a central care and with their symptoms, they will test her for, for coronavirus. Okay. Uh, one more here for COVID. Am I more at risk of contracting the coronavirus because of my treatment? You could, you could uh, definitely. That's why I mentioned about depending on your white count, depending on the therapy for some ladies that are getting metastatic uh, treatment for metastatic disease, their white count could be below normal and that could put them at risk for, for infection. Uh, do you sub suggest an exam for an 18 year old that has fibrodenoma or just stick with the sonograms every six months? So fibrodenomas can be troublesome and they could be diagnosed at early age. I typically those patients, when I get a, a site consult about them, I tell them they should be followed by a breast surgeon and they, they're very religious about checking those patients uh, properly. So I would definitely refer to a breast surgeon so they can do the proper follow-up. Okay, um, another question, uh, that one that you showed me earlier. Yeah, um, do all patients, this is a question that, that uh, uh, Dr. Zachary just received and he posted it on the, on the live. Uh, Dr. Alamani, do all patients diagnosed with breast cancer require radiation after surgery? 
no, not all of them. So patients that have breast conservation therapy, in other words, they keep their breasts because they get a small surgery for their breast cancer, they usually are recommended radiation. For ladies that have a mastectomy, sometimes they also need radiation if they have positive lymph nodes or if the cancer is touching the chest wall or the or the breast or the skin of the breast, uh, or when tumors are over five centimeters. So there's indications for radiation even with a mastectomy as well. Okay, so they should answer that. Um, okay, what about if I successfully completed treatment? Am I immunocompromised? It depends on what kind of therapy, but typically the immunosuppression is very short lived, meaning that you should recover quickly your immune system. Usually within four to six weeks, your numbers should be back to almost to your baseline. And definitely after two or three months, they should be back to baseline. Okay. Uh, what was that? The, la uh, the last question is from here. Okay. Should boils on side of breast be concerning? Uh, boils like in the axilla area? Is that what you're referring to? Can they be more specific? The question is not uh, that specific. So well, that's probably what it is. Uh, for example, cysts that can develop in the area of the axilla it can be associated when ladies actually shave their axillas. So that is not uncommon. That is not a risk factor for breast cancer. And so, but certainly it keeps everybody on their on their on their toes because when you have an infection in the axilla, your lymph nodes can grow a little bit. So when in doubt, you need to see your doctor. Don't, don't assume that it's just an infection if you have persistent lymph nodes or glands that are enlarged in your axilla. Okay. Um, now, earlier you mentioned the alcohol, smoking, and obesity. Um, but the, the question here is, can, can a healthy diet help to prevent breast cancer? And if that's the case, what should we focus on? Like, should we just cut bread? <laughs> so so the, the one thing that is easy to remember is sugar. So when COVID-19 started, the pandemic started in, in late February and early March, there was actually information that came out very important that patients that actually, or people that binge on sugar are, are at very high risk of developing breast cancer compared to those that people that do not binge on sugar. So again, simple sugars are not good for us. Complex sugars, like the ones that we have in fruits are different. They are processed differently by our body. So, so certainly I would recommend, so if there's anything that you want to remember about the diet is avoid sugars. Um, a, a lot of red meats in your diet can also increase your risk for other cancers, not so much breast cancer, but definitely Dr. Sakari knows very well, colon cancer, kidney cancer, and other types of cancers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, can a physical activity reduce the, rest, the risk of, uh, of uh, of breast cancer. Yes. So people that actually exercise tend to have less diagnosis of cancer in general. And that's true also for breast cancer. And also patients that actually exercise during treatment tend to do better than those that do not. Okay. Uh, a close friend uh, asked me the, <clears throat> these two questions last week. The first one, can breastfeeding reduce uh, the risk of, of uh, breast cancer? And the, the second one was, uh, can breast augmentation cause breast cancer? So we don't have any evidence that breast augmentation causes cancer, but certain um, implants that are textured uh, that have been placed for, for many, many, many years in the United States and in other parts of the world have been associated with a type of localized lymphoma. It's called anaplastic cell lymphoma of the breast associated with implants. That is a different type of lymphoma compared to the regular lymphoma. So most ladies that have that type of lymphoma because of the implant, when you remove the implant, the, the, the lymphoma goes away. A minority will require chemotherapy. Very, very few people will require chemotherapy. The majority do not require chemotherapy. So breast cancer per se is usually not increased or the risk is not increased with, with the implants. Now, implants can actually help make a diagnosis of breast cancer. Because if you think about it, you're pushing all the breast tissue forward, especially when they put the implants in the, behind the muscle. So you're pushing all the breast tissue forward. So that means that the patient can feel an, a nodule or something abnormal in her breast easier if they have an implant there. Now, if the, pop, if the lesion is not palpable, then the problem is that all the tissue is now all compressed, the breast tissue, which makes it harder for the mammogram to see it. So again, there are some positives and negatives of having a breast implant. So it could help the diagnosis if you can palpate it, but it can make it harder to diagnose if it's kind of hidden in between the, the breast tissue. 
Um, what was the other part of the question? I forgot. <laughs> it was the breastfeeding and the- uh, Oh yeah, breastfeeding definitely, it will decrease your risk of developing breast cancer as well. So that's one of the positive things about breastfeeding as well. And uh, is it recommended for women to sleep with their bra on or off to, if it's gonna diminish the risk? It doesn't matter either way. That we don't know a good, a good a risk a reduction a therapy with either one of those two. Okay. Um, okay. Is which one is the pain of the breast? All right. Uh, is there a link between oral uh, contraceptives and breast cancer? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I mentioned that ladies that actually are on oral contraceptives for over ten years can increase the risk of breast cancer because they of the higher levels of estrogen. Okay. Uh, the breast is just a couple of days during the month. Could this be related to? Okay, if the pain of the breast is just a couple of days during the month, could this be related to breast cancer? It could, but most likely, if, if it's something that happens every single month, it's more likely to be the way that you are. Some ladies, unfortunately, will have some discomfort with their with their breasts with their menstrual cycles, but if it's something new and you never had that before, that is a red flag. Okay, and we just got a question here. Cysts, can they cause breast cancer? Typically not. Typically cysts are benign lesions. Okay, mm -hmm. I should end, uh, answer that one. Uh, link between all uh -huh. Deodorant, can they cause breast cancer? No. So there's no direct link between the deodorant and breast cancer. And if that was true, then we would have many more patients with breast cancer. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope everybody's using deodorant today. <laughs> I love your sense of humor. <laughs> I remember breast cancer was identified all the way back to the years of Aristotle. So this is not a new thing. So breast cancer has been around for a long, long time. Okay. Um, did we get any anymore uh, let me, i just need to pull <laughs> a list of so you answered this in your presentation earlier that men do get breast cancer uh, i may or may not have mentioned that men can also get breast cancer they compromise less than two percent of all breast cancer cases so it's very rare but i do obviously in my clinic because i do breast cancer i do have patients with a male breast cancer okay uh huh Okay. Sorry, Dr. Almani, I'm trying to keep up with the comments and, no problem, no problem. and I have a few people here following the comments. <laughs> I love my team though. I, I love your team too. <laughs> okay, uh, excessive caffeine, uh, dark chocolate and red wine. So uh, Let's start with the let's start with the coffee. So there's no direct link that we know of of increased amount of coffee drinking and cancer in general. And actually, there's some studies showing that there might be actually a, some protective effect of, of of coffee drinking. So for those coffee drinkers like myself, good news, you can drink coffee. Um, um, for chocolate, there there have been some studies that suggest that potentially can increase the risk for fibroadenomas and things like that, or breast tenderness. So if that is your case, then you should try to limit your chocolate intake. But there's no direct link with, with breast cancer. And then the wine, unfortunately, there is. So when you look at the story of alcohol, if you look at um, beer versus spirits versus wine, when you look at wine, people that drink wine and no beer, they have a higher chance of developing breast cancer. People that drink more beer but no wine, they can still develop breast cancer, but the risk is much lower. And then the spirits are right in the middle. So for example, vodka and rum and things like that, they're somewhere in the middle. So the highest risk of developing cancer comes with wine, not with beer. Okay. Can you ask him? And again, a glass of wine in moderation, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna fault you with that. Sorry, what were you saying? I'm sorry, I missed it. So if we're talking about a glass of wine once in a while, that should not be a big deal. But drinking wine all the time, we know that is a risk factor for breast cancer. Carlos, the main question that we face oftentimes is women who is in the age of 42, probably and older, she does self-breast exam. Once in a while, she feels lump. So what is the next step in terms? Of, that's what we hear from the community. What is the next step? A lot of people, they get confused to do mammogram, to do the ultrasound, to do the breast surgeon. What is the, actually the next step? Yeah, so, so, and that's why I advocate 
young ladies to learn how to to examine themselves because if you know how to examine yourself at a young age every year that passes you know exactly how your breast is changing or not changing so when you get into your 40s which is when the risk starts really going up it then you know how your breast feels or used to feel the the, the last the last month now if it is a new lump i would not ignore a brand new lump that needs to be evaluated especially after the age of 40 but even at age 30 if you feel a new lump that needs to be evaluated as well Okay. But so the next step would be talk to your primary doctor and they will order the mammogram ultrasound and then the proper testing. So the next step will be getting ultrasound, getting a mammogram, then ultrasound and or is Correct. So typically it's the first step is to go to the primary doctor or gynecologist, have them evaluate them, telling them I'm concerned, I felt the lump. It, the, the specialist may be able to feel it themselves. If they do, that really helps them uh, reassure the patient or not, or not tell them that they have a problem and then send them right away for diagnostic studies. Okay, so Dr. Alamani, uh, I think we're good with the questions. Um, if any any patient wants to get in touch with you, do they have to go through their primary care, or they can just call uh, your office directly. So, if any patient that has a history of breast cancer or new diagnosis, uh, one of the best ways to get in touch with the system is call Abin Health Cancer Institute, mm -hmm. and have them connect you with a breast cancer navigator, who is a nurse who will help that patient decide what is the best course of action. And if the patient has a history of breast cancer and needs help, absolutely, we're gonna help her. Very good. So breast cancer navigator, that's the person to All right. So they call Abbing Health Cancer Institute and they, go, they can go to the website, the phone number is there and they will connect them with the breast cancer navigator and they will help them from there. Very good. Any questions, Tim? Is there anything that you would like to add before we end uh, tonight? I, I, commend, I commend you for this beautiful uh, program. You guys are doing an awesome job, really, truly. I, I love you guys. I've loved you even before this, but this is really awesome. So good, good luck and congratulations. Thank you so much, Dr. Alemani. Thank you. My pleasure at your service. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Yes, so we will be sharing... Um, are we still live? Yeah. Okay. So we will be sharing uh, Dr. Alamani's rack card with his contact information for, for the office. However, uh, like Dr. Alamani recommended, the best way to do it is to reach out to Advent Health Cancer Institute and ask for the breast uh, care coordinator. Um, that is the best way to go around it. So that way they will tell you what would be the, the next step. Do you need a mammal? Do you need, uh, or they can help you set up an appointment with Dr. Almani. We want, we um, will be, like I said, we'll be sharing that. We will be sharing uh, flyers with important information about testing and all of that good stuff. And uh, we want to thank everyone for joining us live tonight and for all your questions. We hope we were able to answer uh, all of them. But please don't forget, I was writing my notes <laughs> to make sure uh, I go over that with you guys. Please don't forget to share tonight's presentation for other people to benefit from it. So you can uh, share that on your page. What you can also do is you can ask your friends and family members to like our page. Our goal is to reach out to more people so more people can benefit from it. And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, team, do you have anything yeah. to add? And if anyone does, if you know someone who does not have insurance and lives in Central Florida, please have that person reach out to us via Rita Foundation's page. They can send us a private message and we will be more than glad to assist with their mammogram. We'll take care of it. We will answer their questions to help them schedule it as well. So remember, if you know anyone who does not have insurance and they need to get that mammo uh, taken care of ASAP, please share with them our page and have them send us a message. Is there anything else Tim, that you want to add? Um, this video is going to be, um, it's going to be posted on the wall for anybody that wants to refer back to all the information that was given today. It's going to be available shortly after we log off. So if you want to refer back, go feel free to watch it and share it to all your friends. And if uh, you know someone who, the, who, for whatever reason, they need to ask their questions in Arabic and they would like answers in, in Arabic, please have them send us the questions in the messenger. We have Dr. Uh, Zachary with us. He is an oncologist. Uh, yes, he's subspecialized in gastro uh, uh, 
colon, stomach, and all of that. However, he is well qualified to answer all of those questions and and even and, and you know uh, speak to you directly if needed in uh, in Morocco. Right. Excellent. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Bye. 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 Woo. Peace. <laughs> Woo. Good job.